So let's now move on and prove the opposite direction. So we're going to now assume that the Riemann integrability criterion is true, is met for our function f. And we're going to show that that implies that this is true, i.e. that the function is Riemann integrable over our interval a, b. So we're going to prove this direction of the arrow now. Now this is slightly more difficult, I think, than proving the forward direction that we've already done, but not that much more difficult. But we are going to need a pretty simple result in order to do this. Uh, so we'll look at that result before we then go on to the major bulk of the proof. So the result is this, that even if the function isn't Riemann integrable, the supremum over all dissections of the lower Riemann sums will always exist, and it will always be less than or equal to the infimum over all dissections of the upper Riemann sums. So this is the more general inequality that holds even if the function isn't Riemann integrable. When you have equality, of course, that's when the function is Riemann integrable. When it's not Riemann integrable, then you'll have is strictly less than, this one is strictly less than this one. So I want to just discuss why this inequality is always going to hold true. So firstly, for a function, whether it's Riemann integrable or not, the set of all lower Riemann sums is going to be bounded above and it's going to be bounded above by any one of the upper Riemann sums. So we've discussed how any lower Riemann sum is always going to be less than or equal to any upper Riemann sum. So this set of all lower Riemann sums is bounded above. Therefore, because this is the real line, it will have a least upper bound. So the supremum will exist. Similarly, the set of all upper Riemann sums is bounded below by any one of the lower Riemann sums because they're always less than or equal to every one of the ones here. So again, because we're in the real line, it will have a greater slower bound, i.e. the infimum will exist. So these things are always going to exist. And now how can I argue that this inequality is true? Well, this is the reason. We can do a simple proof by contradiction. So let's call this supremum S for short and this infimum I, not to be confused with the I that we used previously to mean integral. So if we are going to assume the opposite for purpose of contradiction, then we will be assuming that i is strictly less than s. That's the opposite of this being true. If this one is strictly less than this one, or this one is strictly greater than this one. So plotting that on the picture, we'd have i here, and we'd have s here. Now, why is that a problem? Well, that is a problem because this has some length, this little interval, s minus i here, and we can just divide that length by 2. So we can go to the number in the real line that's halfway in between the two, which is just i plus s over 2. And now, because of the definitions of these things, we will be able to find, I'll be able to find you an upper Riemann sum that is closer to i than that blue number, and I'll be able to find a lower Riemann sum that is closer to s than that blue number. So doing this, so I will be able to find you, because of the definition, I remember is the greatest lower bound of all of the upper Riemann sums. So that means that this number, i plus s over 2, this blue number, and I'll just write it down, that's i plus s over 2, that cannot possibly be a lower bound for the set of all the upper Riemann sums, because if it was, it would contradict i being the infimum of this set. So that means there must exist an upper Riemann sum that is strictly less than it. And of course, we know all the upper Riemann sums are going to be greater than or equal to i because it's a lower bound for the set of all upper Riemann sums. So I can find you then an upper Riemann sum that is closer to i than blue. It might actually be equal to i itself, but it's somewhere to the left of blue and not smaller than i. So we'll call that upper Riemann sum upper Riemann sum over d1 of f. And we know that that is strictly less than this number, i plus s over 2. Now, for the exact same argument, in reverse, I can find you a lower Riemann sum that is strictly greater than i, because s, by definition, is the least upper bound of the set of all lower Riemann sums. So therefore, i plus s over 2 cannot be an upper bound for this set. So there must be an element in this set that is strictly bigger than it. So in green there, that's what that's supposed to represent. So this is the lower Riemann sum over some dissection d2. And this is strictly greater than 
i plus s over 2. But of course this is a problem because this one's smaller than i plus s over 2 and this one is greater than i plus s over 2. So we can now conclude that that lower Riemann sum over d2 is strictly greater than that upper Riemann sum over d1, which is nonsense because we know all upper Riemann sums must be greater than or equal to all lower Riemann sums. So that's the reason that that can't be true. It cannot be true that the infimum over all the upper Riemann sums is strictly less than the supremum over all lower Riemann sums. So it must be the other way around that this one is less than or equal to this one. So I hope I've convinced you that this result is true. What we can now do with that result is just rewrite it a little bit. So if we just subtract the supremum of the lower Riemann sums from both sides, we'll get that the infimum of the upper Riemann sums minus the supremum of the lower Riemann sums, that that's going to be greater than or equal to zero. And this is the result that we're going to need in order to prove that this implies this. So just a few more inequalities, two more inequalities that we already know are true that I'm just going to write down, which we're going to use along with this and this to show this. So we know that the infimum of all upper Riemann sums is less than or equal to the upper Riemann sum over any specific dissection. So this gets a little bit confusing with the notation because we're using the same D here. So I'm going to use a different D, so we'll just use D bar. So if we have some specific dissection D bar, then the upper Riemann sum over that specific dissection is always guaranteed to be greater than or equal to the, this. That's just by definition. This is the least, sorry, the greatest lower bound. So it is a lower bound. So it's less than or equal to everything inside that set. This is one of the things inside that set. So we know that. And similarly for the supremum over all dissections of the lower Riemann sums, we know that if we take a specific lower Riemann sum, that that's always guaranteed to be less than or equal to this. So the lower Riemann sum over a specific dissection, which we'll call d bar, is always going to be less than or equal to the supremum of the set of all lower Riemann sums. Again, that's by definition. This is an upper bound for that set. This is something inside that set. Ergo, the upper bound is greater than or equal to it. Right, let's have a look at how we're going to do this then. So we need a bit of space, ideally. Let's um, go over here. So we're going to assume then that this is true. So for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists dissections such that this inequality is true. So such that the upper Riemann sum, and I'm going to change that to d bar, just because we've used d bar here for a specific dissection. So upper Riemann sum over d bar minus the lower Riemann sum over d bar is going to be less than epsilon. So let me just let you in on the plan here. So the plan is we know this inequality always holds true, that the infimum minus the supremum is greater than or equal to zero. What we are trying to show, remember, is that the two are in fact equal to each other. Now that means that we want to show that this actually equals zero. So the infimum minus the supremum cannot be a positive number and therefore the only thing that's left over to it is for it to be zero. In that case, we would have shown that the function is Riemann integrable, which is what we're trying to do. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use this. If I could get an inequality, if I could use this to produce the inequality that the infimum minus the supremum has to be strictly less than epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero, then that, along with this, would mean that the only option left to it is for it to equal zero. Because if it's less than epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero, then it cannot be a positive real number. And the only other option is for it to equal zero. So that's the aim. So I'm going to try and use this inequality along with these two inequalities to get me something of that form. So I want something of the form infimum minus supremum. So in that direction, we're going to start modifying these ones. So I want minus supremum here. So I'm going to firstly modify this one. I'm going to multiply it through by minus one. So we'll get that minus the supremum of the lower Riemann sums is less than or equal to 
minus any specific lower Riemann sum that you have. Now what we can do is we can add the thing that we want in front of the minus supremum. So we want infimum here. We want infimum minus supremum. So let's just add infimum onto both sides. So we'll then end up with the inequality that the infimum, the upper Riemann sums, minus the supremum, the lower Riemann sums, is going to be less than or equal to, and we're going to need some more space, it's going to be less than or equal to the infimum of the upper Riemann sums minus any specific lower Riemann sum that you have. Remember, that's all that that is. D bar could be any dissection you like, any specific dissection. Now, that's not quite what we want yet, so we're going to now modify this inequality. You see how beautiful this is going to be? Hopefully it's all clicking into place now. You see, if I just subtract the lower Riemann sum from this, both sides, then I'll have upper Riemann sum minus lower Riemann sum on this side, and then transitivity is going to play. And then we can apply the epsilon information that we've got up there. So take, oops, I need the pen. Take this one and subtract the lower Riemann sum over the same specific dissection here from both sides. So we'll then get the infimum of the upper Riemann sums minus the lower Riemann sum over d bar is going to be less than or equal to the upper Riemann sum minus the lower Riemann sum. Now combine those two inequalities together there and I'll just zoom out. I don't like doing that because sometimes it means that you can't actually see it. I can still see it, but I hope you can still see it as well. So we've got this one is less than or equal to this thing, and then we've got that same thing here is less than or equal to this. So we can now combine those two things together. Let's zoom back in. And we can get this inequality, that the infimum, of the upper Riemann sums, minus the supremum the lower Riemann sums is less than or equal to an upper Riemann sum, and that dissection d bar could be any dissection. This is going to hold true. We didn't make any requirements on that dissection. So this inequality actually holds true no matter what dissection you put in place of d bar here. So this thing is always less than or equal to this. And now you see how this is going to work. So we know by the Riemann integrability criterion that we can find dissections such that this is indefinitely small, and now I know that this thing is always less than or equal to anything of that form for any dissection, so in particular it's going to apply for all of these dissections as well. So for all epsilon greater than zero, by the Riemann integrability criterion, I can find you a dissection. There exists a dissection which we'll call d bar such that the upper Riemann sum over that dissection minus the lower Riemann sum over that dissection is less than epsilon. So whatever tiny little real number you come up with, I can find you a dissection that does this. And yes, for smaller and smaller epsilons, you might need a different dissection. So if I make epsilon one over a million, I'll find one dissection that'll satisfy this inequality for that. If I make it one over a billion, I might need a different dissection, an even finer dissection such that it's true for that. But whatever epsilon you pick, there always is going to be a dissection such that this is true. And I know now also by this inequality that whatever dissection you put in here, this inequality is true. So this thing is less than the size of this, less than or equal to the size of this. So that means that plugging in all of these dissections that satisfy this into here, I can therefore get that the infimum of the upper Riemann sums minus the supremum of the lower Riemann sums must be strictly less than epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero. From these two facts, I can conclude that that must be true. So therefore it can't be a positive real number because whatever positive real number you took for this, I would be able to find you an epsilon smaller than that. So it cannot be a positive real number uh, and still obey this inequality. So given that we know this inequality up here, where is it? Yes, this one here. Given that we know this inequality, 
we know that it's either positive or it's zero. We know it cannot be positive, ergo we know it must be zero if the Riemann integrability criterion holds. So it cannot be positive if this is true, therefore it must be zero, therefore the two must be equal to one another. And hence we have proven that backwards direction. We've proven that if the Riemann integrability criterion holds true, then the supremum of the lower Riemann sums will be equal to the infimum of the upper Riemann sums, hence the function will be Riemann integrable. So overall then we have shown that these two are mathematically equivalent to one another. We have shown that if the function is Riemann integrable then the Riemann integrability criterion will hold true and we have shown that if the Riemann integrability criterion is true then the function is Riemann integrable. So they are if and only if statements here. So the use of this is that this one is often easier to do actually in practice, only slightly easier, but does often require slightly less work to prove than this one. So many times when we want to show that something is Riemann integrable, we will choose to show this, and then we'll use the fact that we've proven the Riemann integrability criterion in this video to then know that it is Riemann integrable. And with that, we will end this video. Thank you.